Let's begin as we always begin, somewhere within the halls of the metaverse. In this case, the Museum of the Metaverse. And we're going to be talking about an event that will surely have its own exhibit somewhere in the Museum of the Metaverse. It's a real place. I mean, and by real place, I mean a virtual place, so not real. Never mind. Metaverse. What is the Metaverse, you ask? Well, the Metaverse is a cutting-edge 3D collection of brands. Uh, and some of those brands are shown here with logos around them. But we're only interested in one of these mysterious Metaverse ba <coughs> brands. That one being WhatsApp. So what is WhatsApp? Well, you probably know WhatsApp's a messenger application. A secure messenger application. An application in which a message can enter the Metaverse and the metro period of time vanish into the ether, never to be seen again. A place where messages can self-destruct and where you can be confident of your privacy. And that's great, right? That means when you get a message through your WhatsApp messenger, you know it's come from somebody who wants to send you something important. Great. So what happened was somebody was selling the WhatsApp information online. <clears throat> This is November of this year, and I think this is from a forum that I believe is specified in the references. So, selling the phone numbers, right? Because when you register with WhatsApp, you register your phone number so that people can contact you. And you can see some of the counts down here. Africa, about 3 million. Uh, and it goes on down the list of different numbers that are available. They're claiming 273 million. Other advertisements that I found online of this kind claimed up to 400 million, some less. It varied a lot. The idea was name and WhatsApp number were available. In other words, they had your name and they had the associated number. And they were selling the information. Well, there must have been a hack, right? A hack of this secure messaging app. How could this have happened? So well, let's dig into it and see what that would have looked like. So before we get to that, <clears throat> let's talk about a feature of WhatsApp, a convenience feature. You want people to be able to use WhatsApp in a kind of frictionless way. You want them to be able to say, hey man, here's my information, connect to me on WhatsApp. And what that looked like for WhatsApp, and what, what it still looks like for WhatsApp, is click to chat. Click to chat is a feature that lets you create a special URL. And it looks like this, https colon slash slash wa.me and then a string of digits, usually starting with a one. What is all of that? Well, that is your full phone number in international format. So there we go. You can construct a URL that has your phone number in it, and that allows someone to connect to you. When they click that URL, they will come to a dialogue like that, chat, with, chat on WhatsApp with that number, and then continue to the chat. And if you continue to chat, it will then open up WhatsApp, and you can begin a dialogue with the person who has that phone number. Well, what if that person doesn't have WhatsApp? Well, in that case, it helpfully tells you a particular phone number isn't on WhatsApp. Wait a minute. So you click it, and then it tells you whether or not that person has a WhatsApp account for that particular phone number. Well, that's not great, right? I mean, that's providing information to a potential adversary. It's telling them whether or not the number is actually associated with a user in WhatsApp. I wonder if my, if my uh, friend has a WhatsApp account. This will let you find out. Hmm. Alternately, you can use Google. Now, what's happening here is you're doing a Google search. 
and it's a little hard to see on here, but it's basically a search that looks like site colon wa.me, that's that first part of the URL, and then maybe something like plus 44, a country code, and the results are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of information about who has WhatsApp on that country code, because Google is just indexing sites, right? It's just indexing these sites, and then making that information searchable. And so, if you were to do this search and create a script to scrape the results, you would suddenly have lots of information because when you connect in the chat, you'll get people's information and you'll have the name and the phone number and you're ready to go and you're ready to then sell the results of this online. Wow. This was figured out by a researcher on the 15th of this month and reported. Uh, your WhatsApp number is leaked in the open web. So there you go. And a lot of people were then turning around and trying to monetize this by selling the, by scraping and selling that information. Well, there's been an attempt at cleanup. Google has been rapidly removing these from its search index. DuckDuckGo, less so. You can still find a lot of it on DuckDuckGo. Last time I looked, uh, a few of the search engines still had it. Some of them were busy trying to clean it up. There's, there's some work going on to try to fix this because that's not what the people at WhatsApp and that's not what the people who have those phone numbers and have WhatsApp, that's not what they want. And so there's an attempt to clean it up, which means that now uh, when you go there uh, to the search, you won't find very much. And for some people, they've actually removed themselves from WhatsApp. And you can tell because when you try to connect, you'll get link no longer valid. So they're telling you something. Again, they're giving information to an adversary. They're telling you this person used to have WhatsApp and no longer does. And that could be used, for example, for a social engineering attack. You can say, hey, I can't reach you on WhatsApp anymore. Uh, can you connect to me on this new messenger? Give them a URL. When they open it, of course, it installs malware. But why? Why do the phone numbers and the user information, why do they matter? Why is someone spending money to acquire lists of names and phone numbers. Oh yes, social engineering, right? So someone can pretend to be someone else, right? They can connect to you and say, hey, I got a new phone, uh, but I wanted to send you that, that link. Here it is. And then you click on it. Or, and this oddly enough turns out to be one of the weird things that works. You text them. It's like, hey, you know, you still owe me 15 bucks from the other night. You know, Venmo me the money at this address. They do. And then they're out, you know, the money and you've got the money. So there's lots of, there's tons of social engineering things you can do with these numbers. And again, there are millions of them. So if this only works on 1% of 100 million numbers, that's a million people that you hit. And maybe you get, you know, your $10 from a million people and that's not nothing. Okay. So there you go. So this is a fine app by which I mean, it's been fined. The European Union find them, uh, and uh, I, you know, I, I don't know that I have the ability to foretell the future, but this is not their first find, and I can almost predict it won't be the last, right? So we should we should maybe watch this, right? So privacy is the kind of thing that you and your company and you as an application developer should definitely care about because it's something that the European Union and the U.S. Federal Trade Commission and other groups around the world do care about and will punish it. Uh, I put this up for no reason other than to point, up, point out that stocks always go up. Uh, here, they're going up in this direction, which is you know still going up. Uh, so there you go. So there's homework due today. Uh, hopefully you all got that done, didn't have any problem with it. <clears throat> The homework was to modify your code so that you decouple how you choose your privacy from choices that the user makes that may reduce it. Right? So if you look at this, you'll see that privacy that you get, because this is a sensitivity, you're going to use this number, this whole number, 
and by whole number I mean ratio, you're going to use this entire number, there that's better, over epsilon to choose the privacy. Epsilon will be directly proportional to the sensitivity and inversely proportional to epsilon. Smaller epsilon therefore gives you more privacy. Larger sensitivity gives you more privacy. And since sensitivity composes, it's composed of these two parts, right? A numerator and a denominator, which means sensitivity is actually directly proportional to upper minus lower. So you'd like that number to be large and inversely proportional to n. So you'd like that number to be small. All right, just some things to think about. Let's talk about zero trust again. We revisit that. So we gave them principles for zero trust last time, and, and these were the principles. Never trust, always verify. Implement least privilege. And assume you've been breached. The threats are inside your network. That's what you need to be thinking about. And this is a very important principle. This says the perimeter really doesn't matter. Right? The threats are outside the network. The threats are inside the network. But maybe the most important thing on this slide is assume you've been breached. Right? You're changing your mindset. So this gives us some principles to follow when we're designing a system, but it doesn't tell us how to realize those principles, how to turn them into a system that actually implements this. And so uh, last time I got a question about this and I sort of coyly played it off as well, you know, it's, it's hand wavy. Uh, we're gonna address that today. That's the whole focus of today is, what does it mean to implement zero trust? So to do that, we're gonna talk about zero trust at the federal level because there's a particular reason why if you happen to be a federal agency or department or at a federal contractor, this matters a lot to you. And the reason is there's an executive order from the Biden administration telling you to do it. So again, uh, it's an executive order from, uh, from the pre current president, Joe Biden. So depending on your politics, this means it's either really smart or really dumb. But if we can set that aside for a moment and just think about what's in it, uh, maybe we can make some more sense of this. Right? This has been issued, it's almost certainly not written by uh, Joe Biden, but written by someone in his administration who hopes to use zero trust to improve security. And in fact, zero trust is all over this document. It appears in the order uh, 10 times. And you can see, you know, to keep pace with dynamic and increasingly sophisticated, all the words you usually read when you're talking about a, a, a security initiative. The federal government must adopt security best practices. That's essentially a meaningless statement, but we like saying it. And advance towards zero trust architecture, right there. So what does it mean to advance toward it? not 100% clear, but uh, they do make it clear that this is the desired goal. We want to get the entire government to this state where they're operating in a zero trust uh, architecture. Okay, and then they come along with, you know, Apple Pie and all the important buzzwords and acronyms after it, like software as a service. Uh, they're gonna centralize and streamline, you know, good things. Well, they do tell you in here what they mean by zero trust. The term zero trust architecture means a security model. Okay, so it's a model. It's like BIBA. Remember the BIBA model? That was a security model. Remember the Clark Wilson model? That was a security model. Okay, so we're thinking of it in that term. This is a model, right? A collection of components and the way in which they operate together to provide a set of security guarantees. A set of system design principles, hmm, like assume you've been breached, okay, least user privilege, things like that, and a coordinated cybersecurity and system management strategy, strategy, based on an acknowledgement that threats exist both inside and outside traditional network boundaries. That's the no perimeter concept. 
right? Eliminate implicit trust. Okay, so there you go. We're eliminating implicit trust. We're assuming threats are inside and outside the network, and we're building a zero trust environment. That's all good. It still doesn't tell me how to do it. And if I am in an agency or a department or I'm at a contractor, I might be struggling now to figure out what this means and what I have to do to comply with this order. So let's think back for a minute to the perimeter, right? People who are, have gotten on the zero trust bandwagon believe that all our previous models were flawed because they assumed I could build a perimeter and within the confines of my perimeter, I could keep my system clean and free of threats and that's what it was really all about. Now, we know that that's not entirely practical. No, our threats are wandering around our network, carrying devices in and out of areas. Why is that person over here in this secure area with their own device? <sighs> so anyway, as a result, we have to start thinking about things a little differently. Now, that doesn't mean you throw away your, uh, you know, throw away your existing firewalls, right? One of the things that you're going to do is build the wall still because it works, right? It will keep some threats out. And you're gonna deploy some traditional security stuff because that stuff does work, right? All these things do in fact work up to a point, right? You're keeping out sort of the low level threats that don't, not the sophisticated ones, you keep out the low level threats, uh, which reduces the noise, reduces the problems on your network, right? But in addition, you recognize that there are sophisticated actors, and sometimes there's just dumb luck, that will get some of those threats inside your network, and you have to prepare it to address that. All right. So, again, what's going on? In order to implement this, we need a lot more information. If you want to write applications that are going to be a zero-trust applications, then we need to know something about this. And that make no mistake, this has a direct impact on application development. Modern applications need to manage authentication and authorization. They need access to external resources. They want to exchange data. There's a ton of things that you want to do with, with almost any practical modern application. And those are th are places where you need to touch the network and reach out to other resources, and those have implications for operating in a zero trust environment. And so we need to start defining terms, and ideally we would like this thing right here, a reference architecture. A reference architecture tells us here's one way to realize, operationalize, to build a zero trust system. It may not tell you what every single little piece is, but it tells you if you had these components and you connected them in this way, that's what I mean. And it's a reference architecture. Your final architecture may look different. It may have more pieces. It may have fewer pieces, depending upon what you actually need. But this gives you a starting place, a place to begin the conversation, right? It's a straw man. It's something that you put it up and then you can argue that no, the straw man should have three arms and, and, and four legs and zero heads and whatever. And, and, and you, you build the one, you tailor it to suit your particular purpose. But you gotta start somewhere and it helps to have something concrete to be, or at least much more concrete than we've had so far to argue about. So that takes us to NIST 800-207. NIST is the US National Institute for Standards and Technology and they produced this document, Zero Trust Architecture, and by they, I, I mean specifically Scott Rose, Oliver Borchardt, uh, Stu Mitchell, Sean Connolly, Borchardt, I don't know why I said his name funny. <clears throat> so they produced this document, and this provides and standardizes language around Zero Trust Architecture and talks about how you get there. Okay, Now, you shouldn't just assume I can grab this and you know, wander out into the factory floor and begin plugging things in and have a zero trust environment. It's not one size fits all. It's just a set of guidance for beginning your, your path toward 
zero trust. And this came out recently. This was August of 2020. So this came out during COVID times. These people were trapped in their homes, talking to, maybe yelling at each other on Zoom, and that's how we got this document. And so they ad identify a set of basic tenets, what they call basic tenets. And we had those three principles of zero trust before. This is going to take those and then begin to expand them, right? Begin to, to, to tease them apart a little more. Like, like, the, like the Parkerian hexad teased apart the CIA uh, triad a bit. So there's going to be a little more information in here. And the first one is all data sources and computing services are considered resources. So this may seem like, okay, I'm defining a term, big deal, but it has actual impact. This says that whenever later on in this document I refer to a resource, I mean that in a broad sense. I mean any computing service, right? I've got a cloud service that I use but don't own, right? I've got a connection to AWS perhaps. That's a resource and that has to be considered as a resource when I talk about my zero trust architecture. You're bringing your own device and connecting it, that's a that's going to be a resource in my view of what a zero trust world is. It's not just computers in my data center. Right? It includes printers. It includes you know the whole uh, set of things uh, in, that that constitute data sources and computing services for my environment. All communication is secured, regardless of network location. So it, often it was the case that once you were inside a network. Right. Once you SSH, let's say, into a network, you can then move around inside that network fairly freely. Once you had an IP address that was inside of the network, then you didn't need to authenticate or do other things to move around in there. Those days are gone. If you want to move from machine to machine, then that communication has to be secured, and that means authentication, authorization, all those sorts of things. That makes lateral movement hard for an adversary. At least that's one of the ideas. And again, if we're assuming threats can be inside the network, we do want to secure all the communications. Access to individual enterprise resources, right? There's the word resources, is granted on a per session basis. So now we want you to think in terms of sessions. If you've been doing web development, you may already be thinking in terms of sessions, but it may be new if you're building other kinds of applications per session basis. Yeah, that, that's what we want you to think. And so every time you want to connect to the printer or every time you want to connect to a file share, you have to think about authentication, authorization. Maybe your session times out, you have to re-authenticate at some point. You're not automatically being granted access to any resource in the system, including things like print. you have to authenticate to use the printer, right? for a lot of good reasons. Access to resources is determined by dynamic policy, right? Whether or not it's okay for you to connect to a file share depends on environmental factors. It depends on the situation on the ground, okay? And what do I mean by that? I mean, where is your connection coming from? Is it coming from a machine that I expect to connect to that printer? Or is it coming from a machine that I don't expect to connect? Is it coming from uh, a machine that's in a known state or one that's in an unknown state? What time of day is it? What's the current set of threats that I'm dealing with? Okay, Does your connection attempt look like a current, does it have an indicator of concern that looks like a current uh, threat campaign? If so, you know, maybe I don't allow it. So you might be able to connect to the file share in the morning and then discover that the situation's changed and you're no longer allowed to connect to that file share in the afternoon. Okay. Dynamic policy. No asset is inherently trusted. All assets are monitored and their integrity and security is measured periodically. So monitor and measure. So we're going to watch your computer and we're going to, to figure out 
if it's in a state that's safe, and if it's not, maybe we don't let you connect. Okay. So that certainly happens at Oak Ridge. My Oak Ridge laptop has software on it that performs measurements on the computer. It makes sure that I haven't you know, jailbroken the OS, that uh, I have the endpoint software running, that uh, I don't have bad stuff on there. It's actually a problem for me because a project we did a few years back called Hyperion used Log4j. It used one of the vulnerable versions of Log4j. So to maintain that for people who are using it, I have to have a copy of the vulnerable version of Log4j to do that work. But that triggers an alert on my machine and gets me, me marked and can get me kicked off the network. So there's, a, there's some, some push and pull there. But you get the idea, right? We are going, not just going to trust your machine because it's got the right IP address or it's the right MAC address or whatever. We're going to monitor it, measure things about the machine, and then determine whether or not it should be allowed to join and whether it should be allowed to remain on our network. Authentication and authorization are dynamic and are strictly enforced prior to any access. Okay, so this typically means for you in the federal space, you'll implement something called ICAM. I don't want to get into ICAM. You can read about it down here at this site uh, for the federal ICAM. It's identity, credential, and access management. Basically, it's a way of, of dealing with uh, uh, things like elevation, etc. We want you to implement multi-factor authentication because really multi-factor authentication is what everyone should be using, so just do it, right? The policy can even require re-authentication, right? It's been hours since you last authenticated. You might have gone to lunch and someone else is sitting at your computer. Suddenly you have to re-authenticate, okay? We want to collect all the information about assets, networks, and security, so we're gonna log stuff, comprehensive Logging is part of Zero Trust. Periodically, we obtain log information from all assets. Someone I work with, Jeff Nichols, uh, actually uh, helped build one of the systems that collects log information from Linux hosts and sends that back to a central logging server uh, where it can be uh, maintained and then searched later, right? Maybe I go onto my machine and I do some stuff and then I modify the logs on that machine uh, for deniability. <clears throat> Well, those logs are periodically being collected, and so you know I might get caught if I'm trying to if I'm trying to do that. So the tenets, not the tents, right? The tents don't expand anything, but the tenets that we just covered, <laughs> sorry, do expand on those three principles. So if you squint at these, at the tenets, right, you can see some of that stuff coming in here, right? Collect all the information. Authentication, authorization, right? We're going to have least user privilege. Uh, these sort of, the, the parts of that, the three principles show up in the tenets, but the tenets are, are more specific, but they're not specific enough for us to get there. They're just basically a set of, of more concrete ideas. They tell us what we want, but they don't necessarily tell us how to get there. So, but th we're doing better. That brings us to the zero trust architecture and just because i i like picking on this i have to read this a lot this phrase a lot zero trust architecture architecture it's like atm machine uh, so i thought i'd put that on the slide because you'll see that a lot a modern zero trust architecture is complex right it's a complex architecture there's a lot of moving pieces. Those pieces have to coordinate with each other. And it requires a lot of a lot of getting things right so that the right information is flowing into the right place uh, to make a decision. And the complexity is the thing that should scare you about this, right? A complex architecture means there may be places to hide and there may be vulnerabilities in that architecture. So we're gonna go through the reference architecture from NIST, but again, remember, it's an idealized realization and what you actually end up with may vary. So here is the NIST Zero Trust Reference 
architecture. And if it looks complicated, it's because it is. Okay, it's got these boxes around the outside. It's got this stuff in here. It's got a dashed line that you know cuts through this particular box and divides it all up. And there's a lot to talk about in here. But to get started, I want you to focus on the center oval, okay, and the stuff below the dashed line. And that's where we're going to start. So here we have a subject. And remember, a subject is basically a user, right? Someone who wants to do something. They want to do their job. And to do their job, they need access to part of our information technology stuff. They have a system. This could be their computer, their phone, one of our computers. Uh, it's some uh, system. <clears throat> and initially, that system is untrusted. So they say, I want to fill out my time card. I'm going to use this computer to do it. And I want to connect to an enterprise resource like the SAP server that provides time card stuff. <clears throat> Going from an untrusted connection to a trusted connection is the job of this policy enforcement point. So the policy enforcement point takes in information about the subject and the system and the type of access desired. It communicates to some stuff, gets an answer back, and it may or may not then promote that to a trusted connection to the specific resource. Note, I didn't make it a trusted connection to everything. I just said, okay, this is a trusted connection for this purpose to this resource. And the next time you want to access that resource, I got to go through this again. Okay, so that's what we're controlling this stuff right here. Okay, and the piece that's new is this, is, is this policy enforcement point. So let's think about what's going on around this. The top of this is the control plane. Uh, basically, it provides the communication medium for the zero trust architecture. This is how the zero trust architecture talks to its pieces and how those pieces talk amongst themselves. On the bottom is what we call the data plane. And this is where that thing we just talked about happens. This is where subjects access resources uh, or try to and we allow them or we, we don't. The data plane and the control plane should be separate, logically separate. They may be over the same pieces of fiber or the same wires, but uh, they are kept logically separate so that I can't interfere with the control plane. Right? It's got its own encryption. It manages its own connections. Okay, It's not directly accessible to enterprise assets and resources because if it were, I might be able to mess with it, and we don't want to permit that. Around the outside, first we have the CDM system. What is that? That's Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation. Again, we're looking at what's present on all of the system assets. Okay, Is this a computer that has endpoint protection? Has it been scanned recently? Is it behaving the way it should behave? All right? Doing that, remember that measurement stuff we did earlier? We're doing that and we're keeping information about it to inform our decision. We might be in an industry like the defense industry, like the telecom industry, like finance, like healthcare, like really basically any modern industry where there are compliance requirements, right? You've got compliance requirements to keep certain kinds of records to permit or deny certain kinds of access and to make certain assurances about the data that you're holding. And so we build that into the zero trust architecture as well, right? Because we have to be able to enforce those. We're building a system for enforcing policy. And this, this provides us with the specific, the policies that are specific to our industry. And it may be multiple, right? It may be finance and healthcare in the defense sector, in which case, Lord help you. Threat intelligence, right? This, these are typically real-time feeds of information about what's happening in the world right now. 
are there denial of service attacks going on against national laboratories? We'd like to know at Oak Ridge. So tell us, because if there are, that changes our security posture. Is there an ongoing uh, ransomware campaign against manufacturing? Well, I want my manufacturing site to know that so that, again, I can take important steps, right? And these threat intelligence feeds can include what are known as indicators of compromise, things I can look for on my network to determine if that threat has made its way in and if I need to act on it. Threat intelligence feeds can be unclassed and they can be classified, right? If I'm a, a large electric utility like a TVA, maybe I'm getting a classified data feed as well. Activity logs, that's just what it sounds like, right? We're going to log everything we can log that makes sense to log. If we later on have an incident, we'd like to know how they got in, where they got in, where they got to when they were in here, what they might have done. Logs are your way to discover that and then to fix things uh, later on, right? So we, we're going to be keeping those logs. We're going to get threat intelligence. We can then turn around and look at our logs to see if we can observe a threat in our system. Data access policy. These are rules uh, that could be static, but usually they may be dynamic. And they're rules that tell us when to authorize access to a particular resource, right? When should the subject get access to the resource? And that can certainly include stuff like basic, you know, should, should you have access to the time card system? Should you be allowed to enter information? Should you be allowed to see other people's time cards or other people's salary information, right? If you're their manager, yes. When I was a manager, I could see that information. Uh, I'm no longer a manager, so I can't see that information anymore, right? This is the public key infrastructure, and it's, that's just what it sounds like, right? That's, that's managing keys and certificates. It's generating them, provisioning them, revoking them, okay, dealing with all of that. And often that can be on an air-gapped system. Uh, we use a lot of keys, for example, for the black box project that I talked about early on in the, in the uh, course. And for that, there's actually a disconnected machine under my desk, and we burn CDs on it, and then use those and then shred them uh, to provision keys uh, on some systems. You don't necessarily have to go quite that far, uh, but you do need to keep that in here and apply your policies and your continuous monitoring and all the other pieces around here to that component. And that's an important point. All of this applies to everything. Okay. How do I know my threat intelligence stuff should be trusted? Well, I don't necessarily know. So I have to authenticate the feeds. Right? It, the zero trust stuff applies to the zero trust components themselves or else I'm, you know, in for a world of hurt. ID management is, you know, creating and provisioning user accounts, putting them or getting them certificates and keys, making sure they're up to date in the LDAP database so they can be authenticated, those kinds of things. And the SIM is security information and event management, and we just pronounce it SIM. Uh, this is a system that collects security information and it can provide a security dashboard or multiple dashboards for people in your security operations center, your SOC, to direct this whole enterprise and, and provide security. Now, getting into the middle, the policy engine is what actually makes a decision to grant or deny a specific request, right? So here's the subject on this machine. They want to access a resource. They want to uh, access the time card system. And so the policy enforcement point communicates upward. The policy engine makes the decision. And the policy administrator then is charged with executing that decision. Okay, It establishes this connection and it communicates the policy engine's decision down to the policy enforcement point, which is software running on your local machine typically. And uh, that's how that happens. This, the policy enforcement point could be running on your local machine, but it can also, in addition, be running in front of the resource. 
okay? Which means that I might say, I want to connect to this resource. I communicate to the policy engine that says, yes, you can do that. I then launch my connection here, but the policy enforcement point, the second one in front of the resource, can turn around and deny me. So there's a lot going on there, and I would hate to try to build it all myself, and that's okay because there are companies that are doing their best to try to build it. Perimeter 81 is an Israeli company. Uh, their buzzword is software defined perimeter. I'm not sure I know what that means, but okay, that sounds fine. So they're giving you zero trust solutions. CrowdStrike uh, has their cloud native zero trust solution, and they explicitly say they adhere to the NIST standard. And beyond Corp is Google's version of it. There's a Microsoft version, but I couldn't find the cool logo or fancy name for it. But there's lots of competing uh, different companies out there trying to begin to provide sort of the end-to-end, -end, uh, at least the bones of a full zero trust solution. Zero trust architecture takes a lot of the security stuff, all the security stuff we've been talking about in this class, and it tries to turn it into something operational. It, it, it operationalizes it. And if you don't manage it, the zero trust architecture can itself become a risk in multiple ways. Right? Obviously, it can stop you from getting work done. It's almost set up to stop you from getting work done. But it can also be a place where an adversary can take advantage of issues and problems and challenges and confusion uh, to maybe do bad things, and we don't want that. Let's talk about what it means for application development. I said zero trust architecture had a lot of, app of implications for application development, and it does. You need to start thinking of interactions in terms of sessions. Each session is subject to authentication and authorization. You have to evaluate the full context of each session to determine the overall risk. That is, you threat and model your sessions, right? So now instead of thinking about, I've got my app, I'm gonna threat model for my app, I'm thinking about, here's my app, and I've got a session with the database and a session with this external data source and a session with some, some particular uh, device or instrument or other resource out here. And I have to think about threats that apply to that. Determine the attributes for zero trust, right? What do you need? Well, I might need the authenticate identity of the user, the status of a device, uh, things like that in order to complete the task. I have to communicate to the zero trust architecture to do that. And I need to treat every session as if external connections came from outside the trust boundary. I'm basically pretending there's not a trust boundary. Everything is an unwashed, unclean connection. How do I establish trust for that? And the good news is these places are trying to provide you with an API so that you can use their stuff to do these things, right? If you have to build all this yourself, it's a problem, right? It needs to work and coordinate with other parts of the zero trust architecture. And so there's a lot of there's a lot that's implied by that. We need to apply additional security measures. Micro segmentation is one that comes up a lot in this world. So more enforcement and compliance controls, more logging, multi-factor authentication everywhere, right? And so that applies a lot about authentication. And, and it would be great if we have a way to do that. Right? Don't roll your own. Well, it turns out there are uh, providers like Auth0 and Okta that can provide that kind of identity management. And then default deny. So we have to make sure that every stage of the application lifecycle, whenever there's access that we need to grant, we grant it if and only if it's explicitly allowed. Okay. We only let you progress in a video game if you've completed the previous section of the game. We only let you progress in an enterprise application if you've you know, done all the things you need to do. Okay, And that's an application concern. So you know what that means for your application. You have to build that into your application. So adding APIs, even security APIs, is going to expand the attack surface. Why? It's more parts. 
right? Maybe I can attack your system. Maybe I attack the resource. Oh, but now look, there's all this other stuff I can attack. Maybe I can attack the policy engine. Maybe I can try to get a malicious policy installed. Maybe an insider can install a malicious policy for me or misconfigure something, right? This can give me ways to mess with you, right? The whole system is set up to deny access, so maybe I can use the zero trust architecture to do a denial of service against, against you, right? Things like that could happen, and we want to be aware of that, all right? APIs always increase the latent weaknesses of a system. They add bugs. Right? All, add more code, you add more bugs. But we hope it decreases the explicit weaknesses of a system. That is, we're going to add some bugs, okay? but we're adding those bugs in a component that addresses a real security need, and, and we want that trade-off to be in our favor. We're eliminating, right, right. We're, instead, of, instead of building my own authorization, I'm using a commercial system that certainly has bugs in it, but developed by people who spend a lot of time doing this and they've been refining it, and that system is, is probably going to be better than what I would build. And it's probably better than not having authentication. So now I have authentication where I didn't before. That's good, but it's a more complex system because now I have authentication when I didn't before. Okay, all right. Adding zero trust components increases the complexity of the application. Right? It may increase the interfaces you have to work with as an application developer. It increases, it can increase the complexity of your own code. All security is contextual and building in security always involves trade-offs. Okay? You always have to be thinking like that. There's no homework this week because we're gonna do something else this week, we'll find that out next time. Spoiler, it's the, it's the final.